I once asked a young girl, a neighbor of mine, about 12 or 13, what comes to your mind if I ask you about boys and girls? She's a girl of about 12 or 13. And she says, equality. I was stunned. I was also happy and realized that the young ones are more aware of these issues than they were some years ago. So things are changing slowly but surely. And that's a positive sign. So let's turn to feminism. A lot of you have all kinds of questions, confusions, misinterpretations of what feminism is all about. Is feminism anti-men? Is feminism against the institution of marriage? Is feminism about angry women burning bras and shouting slogans? Or is it an alien concept and doesn't have any relevance in our country? Actually, feminism is a very liberating idea. It is asking for equality, equality between men and women, equality of rights and entitlements, equality in our gender roles inside the house and outside the house. Feminists are asking for equality of all men and women, for all men and women across all social divisions, racial divisions, Divisions created by color, by faith, by religion. So in short, feminism is asking for a just and equitable society, which would encompass every single person. Let us go to what a very wise French intellectual feminist wrote. One is not born a woman, but rather becomes one. What is the implication of this very celebrated uh, statement of hers? Basically, it means that women and men are born equal, but society makes us unequal. We are born with different genitals, right? But that makes us male and female. It is process of socialization that we become men and women. But I ask you, why should biological difference lead to different social status? That is the question. Biological differences should not really make us have different access to resources. And as my poster here says, oh, that's why you get higher wages. So biological differences should not be the basis of social differences. The whole socialization process involves the construction of masculinity and the construction of what we call femininity. Stereotyping and control over movements of men and women is something that I'm going to take up next. Boys are asked to be brave, strong, articulate. They are made to think they are superior, and they are going to lead the world. I'm sure many of you would think, oh, is that right? It is because of the way we see them growing. Girls, on the other hand, are asked to be subdued. Don't be argumentative. That's not ladylike. Don't exercise and get muscles because you wouldn't look like a lady. Men are even pushed, boys are pushed to become alpha men, have strong muscles, six packs and whatnot. Girls are told to be gentle, as I said, but further, their movements are controlled. They are told, don't go out by yourself, come home before it is dark. Why are all these restrictions there for women? If you break these rules, the Lakshman Rekha, and go out, and you get raped, you are to blame. Imagine the victim 
of a crime is blamed for the crime committed on her. What kind of justice is this? Girls are always told to be back home before dark. Boys can loiter, hang around outside, have all the fun. Why? Because a woman could be sexually assaulted. So I have a simple solution before you. If men are kept at home, they don't become criminals. And if girls can step out and have fun, they'll be safe. So we have to think innovatively of changing the way we see men and women and expect them to grow up in a more healthy way in which it is possible. <clears throat> Here I have for you a whole lot of symbols. You'll immediately recognize them as traffic signals, right? Stop, there's a red light, don't go ahead, don't overtake. Well, we feminists think these are actually symbols which tell us how to behave in society. Don't overtake the boys. Don't be smarter. Unfortunately, you can't stop that. And girls are doing very well today, as all of us know. And we are proud of that. The next point I would like to discuss is gender roles inside and outside the home. Because a woman bears a child, why should she have the prime responsibility of nurturing and caring for, a child, for the children? Why can't men then take on the responsibility of rearing and bringing up a child? If a man wants to be a homemaker, let him be. If a woman wants to step out, and be the breadwinner, let her be. The question is of choice. Let's rethink gender roles so that we become a more just society. But patriarchy is very afraid. Patriarchy, which is the power system that controls people, is afraid if you question. A girl asks, why should marriage be the be-all and the end-all of my life? She is seen as a threat, a dangerous person. You're questioning marriage? That's not on. Here is a woman who is saying, I don't want to become like you. I'm only asking that you share my responsibility sometimes. You take my place sometimes. That way, we are able to be more just to each other's. Will these days ever come when men will become the homemakers and the caretakers is a question we need to think about. If you ask a question, why is this so? You are told, this is our culture. It has always been so. How can we question this? But let me ask you, who makes culture? People make culture. Culture does not make us. So societies keep changing, and customs and rituals keep changing. However, we find that there are certain rituals and customs which women in India still continue to observe. And actually, those customs are very demeaning to the status of women. For example, let's take two uh, rituals which many of you would know. One is Vatasavitri Puja and the other is Karva Chauth. In both these, women pray to get the same husband for seven lives, even if he is an alcoholic, an abuser, a worthless man. Don't we respect ourselves? Don't we want a husband who would not beat us, who would treat us with dignity and respect? So we have to question these rituals which are passed off in the name of religion. And let's not forget who wrote the texts. God didn't write those texts. Men have written those texts <laughs> across the world, whether it is Christianity or Hinduism or any other. I am a little aware of these two, having studied a little bit of them. The other thing is that in India, customs and culture become so overbearing that you cannot marry across castes or across religion. You must be aware 
of the Kap Panchayats and their role in upholding these norms. So if you break those lines, what happens? You are boycotted, you are even murdered. And there have been these cases in the state of Haryana where a couple who was married across caste was brutally murdered. Let's not forget that if you challenge customs and tradition, you can be punished. Take the case of Bhavri Devi. I'm sure many of you have heard of Bhavri Devi. It became a film, but the real story is that Bhavri Devi, a low caste woman, a government employee, doing her job of creating awareness for eradicating a practice like child marriage. She is gang raped by upper privileged men for daring to question them when they were going to finish the cer ceremony of a child marriage. So this is what you get when you're trying to change the culture. How are we going? Our constitution gives us this freedom to marry across caste, to marry across faith and religion, but society has to move forward. It has to change these perceptions. <clears throat> so feminists are not out to break the institution of marriage. We don't want it to be reduced to child marriage. We don't want it to be reduced to marriages where there is no respect, there is no love. What women want, they want the family, they want the children, they want to be respected for all that they do to keep the home and the family together. So that myth is definitely something which you have to rethink of. Remember that the next myth that I would like to address is that feminism is alien and Western to our culture. That is absolutely nonsense. Feminism is universal. Right from Draupadi of the Mahabharat, who questioned Yudhishthir's right to gamble her away, to Malala in Pakistan, who stood up against the Islamic fundamentalists who were denying girls the right to education, to Toni Morrison, the African-American novelist, who said, if you want to fly, girl, get rid of all that is weighing you down. So feminism is really universal and nothing alien about it. So the beauty of feminism is that it is not one. There are many feminisms. It's culture specific. It's born in a social cultural context. So we have our own Indian feminism. I'm sure you remember Mirabai from Rajasthan who gave up her kingdom and wandered around looking for love looking for her Krishna who symbolizes love. You have Akka Mahadevi of Karnataka. You have so many other saint poets. These are the early feminists in my mind. Later we have Savitri Bai Phule, our very own Puna person. Pandita Ramabai, Tara Bai Shinde. All these women are feminists because they questioned patriarchy. They questioned patriarchy and the control that men had over religion. They questioned casteism. They questioned enforced widowhood. They questioned child marriage and the denial for education to girls. So these are the feminists who started questioning so many years ago. The questioning begun then continues even today. For the fear of abuse has not gone. So even privileged women are still waiting for things to change. What women want is a partnership. We want men to join us in this struggle to construct a just and equitable society. To your mind, it must be, uh, the question must be coming, what can I do? To the girls and the women, I say, do anything, small or big. Anything that will enable you to voice injustice. Let's not forget a very important thing that has happened. The Right to Information Act that we all talk about and use, many of us, was 
born out of a struggle of poor laboring women, daily wages in Rajasthan. Young girls today are doing extremely innovative things. They have put together, a bunch of young feminists have put together an exhibition of the clothes worn by rape victims. They have gone and collected it. And this way, they have proved and busted the patriarchal lie that women get raped because they are scantily dressed. So you can think of doing very innovative things as young women. As boys, what can you do? As boys, you can listen to what women have to say. Dialogue with them. Put yourselves in their positions and look at the world. That way, you will become sensitive men and join hands with the women in their So we are not wanting to take control of the world. Men need not be threatened that we are anti-men. We want you, but we want you as partners in this struggle for justice. And I would like to end with a statement made by a radical colored woman who was fighting racism. And she said, nobody is free till everybody is free. Thank you.